afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's panel on activism and grassroots change. I'm Bethany Barrett. I'm a professor of political science and director of the Joseph Laundy Human Rights Project, which engages students in cross-national experiential learning and community-driven research to advance human rights, human rights, social and environmental justice in urban settings. Before we start, in the spirit of the American Dream Reconsidered, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Potawatomi, Miami, Osseti Squan, and Peoria peoples. It's an honor to moderate tonight's panel with Sharina Lemzade and Ben Wickler, who I'll introduce more fully in a moment. These leaders spend their days working to make positive change on important social, economic, and political issues. They'll share their expertise on how to organize national campaigns, discuss the intersections of politics and social justice, and talk about the lessons of the past several years of activism, contentious politics, and electoral outcomes. Of the many inspiring conversations of the American Dream Reconsidered Conference, none could be a greater honor for me to moderate than this one. First, it's been my privilege here at Roosevelt to work with so many students who are talented and passionate organizers in their own right, and I've learned so much from them. Second, this is a political moment when, counterintuitively, challenges around, much grassroot, around which many grassroots organizations are doing most of their activity may seem more daunting than at any time in recent memory. But that organizing has also never been, in my, in my sense, more important. Witness, for instance, the exciting ways that current threats to democracy and sustainability have galvanized fights for visibility and forged new and exciting intersectional alliances. Much of my own organizing is around the Keystone Pipeline route a few miles from my family farm in Nebraska, where ranchers, farmers, and tribal nations, Democrats and Republicans alike, have come together in an unprecedented alliance to protect the critical Aglala Aquifer. So I'm beyond excited to welcome two such courageous and effective organizers. The format tonight is fairly straightforward. We'll have a 45 to 60 minute panel discussion, then we'll turn to you and take your questions over about 15 minutes. Our main attractions here, of course, are Ben Wickler and Shireen Alemzadeh. Shireen is the co-founder and co-director of Healing to Action. She collaborates with worker leaders to address gender-based violence in low-wage workplaces across Chicago. Her career is focused on building bridges between social movements, applying intersectional approaches to human rights activism by promoting shared leadership as a path to sustained social progress. Led by the voices of workers and survivors, she writes, educates, teaches, and organizes to create stable economic futures for people of all genders. Ben has played a leadership role in some of the most critical political fights of recent years the battle to save the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid, the defense of dreamers, immigrants, and refugees, and the rise of the blue wave of 2018. A former senior advisor and Washington director for MoveOn.org, Ben's organizing stretches back actually to his student days, so if there are students in the audience, you can make a difference now. Uh, when he co-founded the Student Global AIDS Campaign and the Harvard AIDS Coalition, representing the SGAC at many international fora, including the UN, he also served as editor-in-chief and contributor to several publications, including, um, most notably to me, The Onion, um, which, <laughs> which I think is a mark of pride. Most recently, on June 2nd, 2019, Ben was elected chair of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. So let's just jump right into our first question, which is I'd love for you both to share a bit more background, um, if you don't mind, about your current role and your journey to get there. Would you like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I can start. Um, well, thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's quite the honor. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity. So Healing to Action, our mission is to advance a worker-led movement to end gender-based violence. And we do that through uh, developing the leadership of people most impacted by the issue, particularly low-income people of color in Chicago. We also partner with labor unions and worker centers and other uh, organizations across Chicago who have organized leaders already to build their capacity to mobilize their membership base to address gender-based violence um, in uh, low-wage workplaces and across their communities. 
And we also do coalition building work between the labor movement and the movement to end gender-based violence, two movements that have not traditionally worked together. And in that coalition building work, we uh, launch grassroots campaigns that leaders, that worker leaders develop that respond to the realities that they identify and the root causes of violence in their communities. The reason that I uh, co-founded Healing to Action was actually that my journey to organizing was a little bit unusual because I came into it as an attorney. Um, so I had, have spent my whole career working uh, with survivors of gender-based violence and particularly survivors from low-income communities of color. I've done that across the country. Um, but I started practicing law representing survivors of workplace sexual violence. Um, and there was actually a, a moment that was fairly pivotal. I, up until that moment, I had noticed as I was trying to find clients who would be wanting to bring forward cases against major corporations, um, against other uh, powerful entities, that it was really hard that people who had the most um, egregious cases, the strongest claims, were often the least likely to want to pursue those claims because of all the barriers that they faced to coming forward. And that really crystallized for me in an encounter I had with one worker. Um, where I met her, she was coming from a factory on Chicago's far south side. She came to meet me in the loop um, after work one evening and she had come straight from work so she was still in her uniform, in her factory uniform and she um, had machine grease on her hands and she told a story of being um, sexually assaulted by her supervisor over the course of many years. So she had been um, raped, and then she also had been threatened in multiple, um, in multiple ways. She was the single mother of three children. She was undocumented, and so she was threatened with immigration consequences. She was threatened with being reported to the police, and she was threatened with physical harm to herself and her family. So as you can imagine, this was a very viable case. Um, it was extremely egregious and heartbreaking, and she was in tears the entire time um, that we were that we were meeting. Um, and so we talked to her about her legal options. We talked to her about how we thought she had a strong claim. Um, but she decided that she could not proceed with that claim. And the reason that, one of the reasons that she gave for that is she didn't want her daughters um, to know what had happened. She blamed herself for what had happened. She felt that she was weak. And um, she didn't want that kind of. Um, she didn't want that kind of story coming out into her community and particularly to her family. And so for me, that was a really important moment of recognizing that I was practicing law in Illinois, which is, has some incredible protections for workers, particularly for women workers and for survivors of gender-based violence, some of the best in the country. But that without organizing a community of support behind the most marginalized workers in order to change the culture and in order to create the mechanism for people to come forward and fight these battles, in a way that made them feel like they were gaining power and not losing it, that my work was going to be ineffective. Um, and so that's really why I decided to uh, launch this organization with my co-founder, who was, uh, who's also a public interest attorney, who was in that meeting with me that evening. Um, and that's really kind of where it all began. Um, so that's, that's really the story of how Healing to Action started. Thank you, Shireen. That's incredibly uh, moving and disturbing. Um, uh, thanks, Bethany, and thanks, Shireen. I didn't know that story. It's amazing. Um, I uh, am in my, my new role as the chair of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, um, in part so Wisconsin can get those kinds of protections that you have in Illinois. Um, we, Wisconsin is where I grew up. Um, I, uh, my first political activity, I was seven years old, and I went with my mom to a Jesse Jackson rally on the state capitol. Um, so that's... Uh, the first, I didn't have much to do aside from sit on parents' shoulders, but it was very exciting. <laughs> um, my, uh, so I'll tell a little bit about the party and then how I wound up doing what I'm doing now. Um, our mission at the Democratic Party of Wisconsin is to elect Democrats up and down the ticket and to pass the progressive agenda into law to make people's lives better. And uh, there's obviously two big parts of that, which is elect people and then do something with elected power. But right now we're kind of particularly stuck on that first one, because mm -hmm. Wisconsin is a state that has a long progressive tradition, but has, uh, has been under a dark cloud since 2010, essentially. Um, the, the painful irony, Wisconsin was the state with one of the sort of most um, 
honored and cherished clean civil services with anti-corruption laws, with transparency, with this tradition of good government. And uh, Russ Feingold was our senator. I interned for him when I was in college. He passed the McCain-Feingold camp Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act. And it was struck down in the Citizens United decision. And dark money then flooded into Wisconsin, defeated him in 2010 from the Senate, um, led to a total Republican sweep in 2010. And then Scott Walker came in as our governor and set about under, undercutting both the basis of the Democratic Party and progressive politics and also uh, sort of the functioning of democracy. So um, Act 10 famously attacked workers, uh, public sector workers' rights to organize. They later made Wisconsin a right to work state. They changed campaign finance laws so that uh, unions couldn't contribute significant sums, but individual billionaires could give unlimited sums to the state party, which could then regrant it to state candidates like Scott Walker. They changed voter registration rules to make it tough for students to Oops. To make it tough for students to register voters on campus, they changed, uh, they gerrymandered the maps so that uh, even though Democrats won 54% of the vote in Wisconsin in, for assembly seats in 2018, they only got, uh, Republicans got 63 out of 99 seats in our state legislature. Um, on, in, in mechanism after mechanism after mechanism, they tried to institute a system of uh, essentially Republican rule rather than Democratic small d rule in the state. And um, I, having grown up in Wisconsin, inspired by people like uh, Tammy Baldwin, who I, when I was a high school student, she was a state representative, and I used to organize debates between state legislators, and, and she would always come and win the debates and then ran for Congress. My friends and I volunteered on her campaign um, when I was in high school, and after her election, the headline in the local paper was Youthquake, because so many people had gotten, so many young people had gotten involved in a race. Yeah. Um, friends and I uh, organized a statewide campaign to testify to the state legislature about school funding and had the experience of you know, walking into this august chamber with our backpacks and explaining what uh, was happening to our schools because of the lack of funds. And then the state legislature responded and, and increased special education funding that year by $20 million. And we had this sense of participating in a functioning democracy. That has now been radically undermined in the state. And uh, there are these terrifying national studies that uh, find that the public opinion of the bottom 90% of the income scale has no discernible impact on the actions of Congress, that only the opinions of the 10% shape congressional action. Mm. Uh, in Wisconsin, it's essentially even worse. It's this tiny handful of the funders of, uh, of the Republican Party and, and the top Republicans. Uh, Reince Priebus was the chair of the state Republican Party when Scott Walker was the, mm. was the governor. Um, they've instituted a system that is democracy proof. And you can see after Democrats won in 2018, uh, the Republican state legislature instituted a lame duck session of the state legislature to essentially strip power away from the newly elected Democrats, the governor, the attorney general, and move it to the state legislature, which was only in place because of the gerrymander. So now the attorney general can't settle cases without approval from the Republican-controlled state legislature, for example. Uh, the governor can't modify how the voter ID laws are implemented without approval from the state legislature, which of course, is elected because they're able to suppress votes through their voter suppression laws. So in all these ways, uh, they're trying to prevent Wisconsin from being a, a democracy in the, in the general sense. And the hard part of this is, Wisconsin is now the tipping point state in the 2020 presidential race. All the, if you take all the states where Trump is less popular than Wisconsin, it's not enough to win the Electoral College. And all the states where Trump is more popular than Wisconsin, it's not enough to win the Electoral College. You have to win Wisconsin. Whoever wins Wisconsin becomes president, and they're trying to prevent it from working as a democracy. And so um, I came to this job because I love big fights. I, I sort of discovered that as a kid. In college, I got involved in fighting the global AIDS crisis, then did international climate change advocacy. Um, I moved on, worked on the ACA repeal fight. Um, I've always wanted to move home and moved home last year and learned that the current state party chair was thinking about not running for another term. And I just, uh, what I've found in life is that when I'm not working on something that feels like the biggest fight I can find, I get very anxious and wonder what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> and so I ran for state party chair this spring and um, now I never wake up wondering whether this fight is important. Uh, there are lots of other things to worry about every moment. Um, but the, the next year and a half, um, and frankly, this is true for Illinois folks, too, because you're very close to Wisconsin. <laughs> um, what happens in Wisconsin uh, is going to shape the future of, you know, of my kids and, and every kid around the world, because it's going to affect what happens in our national politics, and it'll affect what happens in the future of the state. 
Uh, Republicans are now three votes away in the state legislature from getting super majorities. And if they get those, they'll be able to lock in gerrymandered maps for another decade. And so we're fighting both to stop Trump and also to stop Republicans from locking in on Democratic control of the state um, for, until at least 2032. Uh, and if we can do both of those things, if we can win both of those fights, we'll have a democracy and I'll be very excited. <laughs> so for some people, those huge national slash global fights uh, feel less um, motivating and more terrifying, <laughs> right? So for those folks who are maybe more likely to get engaged locally and who maybe um, can imagine themselves getting more engaged locally or maybe see the fights that are closest to them or most important on a daily basis as being local, um, what would you say, Shireen, is kind of the connection of that and the importance of that grassroots, really localized organizing mm -hmm. to some of these bigger picture fights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, starting really local sounds like more manageable, but, but then you start to do it and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is a big fight too. Um, but it's a different fight. It's a different set of questions, I think. Um, you know, a lot of the issues that Ben just raised are structural issues, issues around structural inequality, um, structural oppression. But those structures play out in people's everyday lives. And um, when you're working in communities, there's a different set of questions that you have to ask. And the first question that, that we typically have to ask in our work is, what are the conditions that have to be present to even have the conversation? Mm -hmm. So how do you even start people talking about this topic? Um, for us, the topic is gender-based violence. It's a very difficult topic for people to talk about. It's often a topic that is really uh, present in their lives in a way that having a discussion as a community might even include people who have committed acts of violence against each other. So thinking about how can you even start to create like conditions where people feel safe, where they feel like they can define solutions that are meaningful to them. All of those questions are the ones that I that I start to, that I think about all the time. Um, one example I can think of is right now our co our first cohort of worker leaders who've designed their first grassroots campaign are fighting for comprehensive sexual health education for all Chicago students. Um, they see this as a root cause of gender-based violence in their communities. Many of them feel that if they had had access to those concepts, they maybe wouldn't have been in some of the situations they found themselves to in. And most of our uh, leaders are actually um, immigrants. They're actually immigrant mothers who have uh, come here later in life and certainly did not have access to any form of sexual health education. And so we've been thinking about how to have this conversation in their communities, how to talk about the campaign and the demands. And we uh, did a lot of work this summer planning teach-ins across the city and schools and mental health centers to try to have that conversation. And it just so happened that both those uh, events that we planned in June and July coincided with announced ICE raids. Um, and so we thought to ourselves about, you know, what is the impact of this? How does this slow things down? How, does the, how could this be an opportunity to tie this issue to immigration injustice? Um, and so that's just one example of when you're in a place and you're with a group of people and you're really trying to figure out how do you have a place-based conversation about a huge overwhelming social justice issue or social inequality issue, how do you create conditions where people feel safe? So one thing we did was had we had the events in schools because some people would rather be in their kids' school than they would to be in their home during that time. Um, you know, making sure that we had mental health support, making sure that we had know your rights information. Um, so it turns into these really kind of granular logistical decisions that you have to make, but they're tied to these much broader social inequalities. Um, and so I think that, you know, that is, while it's, it's in, in, in itself, it's somewhat overwhelming to think about how you can create those conditions in your own life, in your own community. That is one way that you can start to grapple with these larger social inequalities in a really effective way. That's really helpful. And Ben, you kind of just made this move from doing, from Move On, which is kind of a grassroots organization, but on a national level. Um, to this elected position with the Democratic Party. So could you maybe talk a little bit about what that transition has been like and what more specifically, I think you've already spoken to this a bit, but um, how electoral politics 
and grassroots organizing kind of relate to each other, in your opinion? Absolutely. So at, at Move On, uh, I used to say that our mission was to get uh, progressives elected and get elected as progressive. So we did a lot of, we would fight to elect people and then we'd fight to push people to actually do things once they were in office. Right. At the, in the state party, we don't you know, advocate two elected officials in the same kind of way. We do try to equip them to go into battles with messages that work, with grassroots support when they, when they do great things. Um, the, the thing that was striking to me, I mean, I, you know, if you've ever worked in a party apparatus, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever done that. Most people have not, I had not. Uh, I had volunteered for campaigns, I hadn't worked at a party. Um, when I started learning about what was involved, I was struck that actually um, my job as state chair would be and now is, it's essentially an organizing job. That hmm. uh, state parties are actually just collections of people, national parties are kind of collections of people. I think as you get to the national level, there's more kind of like big money and organizational interests that get involved. But in Wisconsin, there's if you go to any county, there's these local county clubs that have meetings and they just get together and talk about what's going on and then people sign sign up sheets and it's just like that kind of activist group meetings that I grew up going to. Okay. It's just that those wind up being the candidates who then become a majority on the county board or you know can stop the super majority in the Republican uh, you know state controlled state legislature and my uh, so in Wisconsin it's a it's a elected position from party members that go to a state convention and I act, my campaign strategy was actually the same as my the campaign strategy that someone suggested to me for a student council race which I didn't do and then I lost which was uh, <laughs> it was my when I was in college I, I uh, decided to run for undergraduate council vice president and it happened that the chair of the American Association of Political Consultants was on campus at that moment. So I thought, oh, I'll ask this guy for advice. So I go in and he's like, in a race like this, you should just talk to every single voter individually and then you'll win. And I was like, that sounds like great advice, but I'm gonna focus on making really good posters and like <laughs> try to get the endorsement of the school paper. And I did those things and I lost in a landslide. And this time I just called everybody and listened to them. And like, the, it's, it's so funny because it's like the core of grassroots organizing is one-to-one -one conversations where you listen, mm -hmm. you build relationship, you understand what people care about, and then when you communicate, you weave together the voices of all the people that you're in community with so that it becomes an us rather than a me. Mm -hmm. And running for state party chair was actually the same kind of experience as that. In a funny way, at Move On, we were doing, that we had a little team and millions of members, and so we were, we had these systems for listening at scale where people, everyone who wrote in, we had a team of volunteers who would read every incoming message and then sort them and send out a report about every message that we were getting from our you know, thousands of people who wrote every week. And we had uh, polls that we sent out every week to random samples of our membership to find out what issues were on people's minds and all these kinds of things. And it was actually at a bigger scale than now with the state party. At the state party, like there was a bunch of individual conversations and I now have a sense of how Lafayette County Democrats are recruiting candidates for school board, and it's great. It's, I sort of fell in love with democracy in the course of this, because you discover how much these, these building blocks are assembled of just groups of people who want to try to change something. And I, I, I become less cynical in the process, which is sort of the opposite of what's supposed to happen when you get exposed mm -hmm. to a political party. Um, but the, the challenge now, looking into this next year, um, there, it's like, it's like what you're describing, where there's all these huge external structural forces that press in on the fights that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to register voters, I'm now discovering all these obstacles that Scott Walker put in place to make it incredibly hard for people who, if you don't have a printer in your house, mm -hmm. you can't print your proof of residence. And if you can't print your proof of residence, like how do you get, how do you mail a printout of your proof of residence to the clerk? Like, all these kinds of things become organizing challenges that come down to these, these granular logistical mm -hmm. kind of choices and designs about how do you accommodate all these things at the same time. And um, yeah, it's, it is complicated. Mm -hmm. I think the, thi the thing that, the other side of the coin for me on this, and I think it connects with what you face also, for me what's energizing and what I find often gets, sets people into motion as an organizer is when you have a theory about, you know, all these things are happening, but if you do this, you can have an impact on it. Breaking it down to an actual, a piece of the fight that you can actually do. Yeah. And that to me has, like, paralysis comes, I think, from powerlessness, from the sense that, like, it's all too much, and there's, no, like, it's not, even if you do all these things, it won't add up to anything. And so much of the work of organizing is finding the piece of the fight that if you get together, 
you can win, and that like it is believable that taking the action will have the effect. I think it's in some ways easier to to win a battle like that than it is to get people to recycle, because it's hard to understand why recycling one can is going to you know save the environment, which is a huge thing. But if you can get you know this school board to decide to adopt comprehensive sex education, like that people can understand there are nine people on the board or whatever, and we can go talk to them, and that. What's exciting is discovering your own power. And I think especially for groups that maybe have been marginalized and maybe haven't discovered their own power until maybe recently or are just starting to, that running into roadblocks can have a disproportionate effect compared to maybe yeah. people who have always had political power, or economic power. And so, and, and you guys have both done so much in you know, your like relatively short careers so far, like you're both really young in the grand scheme of things. So I would love to hear a little bit about how, um, how like what challenges you have, or like maybe just one challenge that you have run into that you have learned something from that you would maybe sort of tell kind of up and coming organizers about as a lesson that maybe would keep them from getting discouraged when that roadblock pops up for them. Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to go first. Should I go back? Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> take a shot. I, I think that the thing that I go back to the most in organizing campaigns is there's, there's this concept of problems versus issues. Problems are like a thing that's wrong, and issue is something that you can do something about, something mm -hmm. that can change. And uh, there's a, a concept in organizing called issue cutting, where you cut an issue out of a problem. Right. You find the piece that you can actually affect, and you figure out who's the decision maker, what is, like, you know, who's the person or, or group of people who, if they change, if they decide one way or the other, it affects the thing you care about. And then what do those people care about? And like, how can you basically, it's called power mapping. You take the mm -hmm. set of decision makers and figure out who or what has power over them and how you can affect those things. And when you break it down into the kind of like, you actually like draw a diagram on a piece of paper, it, make, it changes things from being like overwhelming to just being a kind of like design problem. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I think when you're on, on the right track, you always discover is that your target, there's cracks within it. That, that anything that where you're able to affect it, it's not just outside force that overwhelms it, it's rather that like there's a debate within the school board. I remember when I was in college, um, I was involved in this campaign to get Coca-Cola to provide AIDS treatment to all the bottlers and delivery truck drivers in Africa. Uh, Coca-Cola is the biggest employer in Africa. They made this big announcement that they were providing AIDS treatment for all of their employees in Africa, and then it turned out they were only referring to their managerial employees, which is a few thousand mostly white uh, executives for the international corporation and not the huge you know, group of other folks. So um, I worked with students all across the country, especially students in the Atlanta area, that whenever Coca-Cola executives came out and spoke on campuses and had recruiting events, students would get up and start challenging them and put Coke equals death on Coke machines in their schools and send pictures of it to the company. And uh, I later found out that the Coca-Cola, when they made their announcement about AIDS treatment, had like worked with this group called the Global Business Council on AIDS that was like advising companies about how to do stuff about the global AIDS crisis. And Coca-Cola executives rushed to the Global Business Council on AIDS and said like, how do we get these students to stop? And the Global Business Council on AIDS was like actually people who were really sympathetic to us. And they were like, well, maybe you should provide treatment to all your employees <laughs> in Africa. And within a few months, they made this decision and you know, extended treatment to all, all the 100,000 employees that they had. And, um, the, you know, the key thing was figuring out that it was those executives, it was, it was like executives in the Atlanta headquarters who were the ones who could make the decision, and they were trying to look good on this issue, and so having, having that blow up in their face was able to make the difference. Um, the, the biggest enemy is hopelessness, and like, find, like finding, it's, it's like Star Wars, like the key thing is finding the schematic so you can find the ventilator shaft into the Death Star, and until you have that, <laughs> like, until you have that, your goal should be to find that. Once you find that, then your goal is to fly into it. Um, but I think just running at the Death Star tends to be a little overwhelming, and the key thing is finding the strategy. Yeah, I love the analogy. <laughs> yeah, those are some good analogies. Um, so I think th there's so many things that you've said in the last couple comments have really uh, resonated with me. And um, one of the challenges that we deal with a lot in our work is that um, are most of the people that we organize don't have electoral power. 
um, and or they do, but they don't have real access, as you mentioned. So people with disabilities, people that are working multiple jobs, voting is not necessarily a viable option for them. And so how do we make sure that if they are at the margins of this social issue, if they are the ones that, um, you know, whose, whose needs are most easily bargained away, how do we make sure to keep their voices central to the fight? One example that I'm thinking of that's rather recent is um, Illinois just passed a $15 minimum wage, um, which was a huge victory, and a lot of my very uh, well-esteemed colleagues were a part of that fight, um, but tipped workers were left out. And that was, uh, there's a very strong presence by the National Restaurant Association here in Illinois, and that was the deal that was cut. Um, and certainly most of the people in the coalition fighting for this are not, they want tipped workers to get the same minimum wage as everybody else. Um, but that was how things landed. And for us at Healing to Action, this was a really important issue because tipped workers are by far the most vulnerable to sexual harassment among all the different workforces. Um, they bring the highest number of complaints to the EEOC every year around sexual harassment. And part of that is because they earn about two thirteen an hour at the federal level, mm -hmm. and the rest of their wage is made up in tips. And that means that they are accountable to multiple people every hour of their job. And so if somebody wants to harass them in exchange for a tip, um, it's very hard for them to refuse uh, those kinds of advances because their, their livelihood depends on putting up with harassment. So these are, again, these are some of the survivors that are the, have been always been the most marginalized, have been always the most vulnerable to these fights, to, to these issues. And so thinking about how can we make sure that this fight is not forgotten, that the majority of low wage workers across Illinois are not moving on to another fight. And, um, and then also, how can you strategically address the fact that, you know, you don't want to necessarily undercut the incremental change that is happening. You are in solidarity with a lot of the people that are having these fights, but you do want to figure out how to use that as an opportunity to elevate your issue, to amplify your issue. And then for people who are who are winning, you know, for when you have that campaign win, how do you create space for these uh, for these more marginalized voices to come forward and to use your victory as a platform for their own issues? And that's something that I think is really, really challenging. And you see it all the time in the way that we message our, our campaigns, our social, our, how we cut the issues. So you see all these different groups, you know, criminalized people in the immigration fight, um, women of color and racial justice issues. As I mentioned, tipped workers and other kinds of marginalized workforces when you're talking about union battles. These are the groups that need these protections the most and are oftentimes left behind. Um, so when I think about how we can create those opportunities, um, it's difficult, but it's really, because some of it is actually accountability work within our own social movements and really holding people to task when they're building social progress on the backs of the people who need those protections the most. Um, so I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, I think, though, and kind of returning back to this theme about local organizing versus the national fights, power mapping that you talked about, that's something we do a lot with our leaders, and it's really interesting because one of the, the ways that we try to help people see their own power and claim their own power is not just by looking at the target and who are the secondary targets and like who are the different relationships and how can we move that map so that the person that we're targeting has no option but to say yes to us. We, try, we do all of that, but also it's for them to map their own relationships and their own communities and to see all the different networks they have, all the different assets that they already have. Um, and so connecting that to this national work, connecting that, and I'm thinking specifically right now of the Me Too movement, connecting that to these stories that are being shared across the country. I think for the issues that we work on, what, it, what the, other, the other thing that organizing has a great power to do, especially at the national level, is to break that sense of isolation. Um, even, even at the local level, I'm thinking about a couple years ago, we had a symposium where we worked very hard to get workers from across different low-wage industries into one room together to talk about their experiences of sexual violence in the workplace. And it was retail workers and factory workers and domestic workers, and it was uh, black workers and Latinx workers and Filipino workers, and everyone was together in one room to talk about their experiences of being raped on the job, of being assaulted, um, of being retaliated against when they tried to claim their rights. And what we saw was that having everyone in that room together 
all of a sudden, this was not a problem that was unique to this person and their circumstances. And like, you heard people say things like, oh, I thought this was just something that happened to Filipina domestic workers because of the conditions of our workplace and because of the immigration circumstances that we find ourselves in. But actually, it's also happening to black hotel workers in Chicago. So breaking that isolation, I think, is a really key to, a, to building this larger um, base, a larger power base of highly marginalized people. And in order to do that, you have to build those relationships and those opportunities. And I do think that national storytelling, like these, these types of national campaigns that emerge, can really create those opportunities. I think you guys just did a beautiful job of expressing how it, both why it's important and how to, in a moment of very divisive national and international rhetoric, that solidarity and finding commonality is so important because we really do have so much in common with you know, other, everyone who's kind of losing out because of the current kind of extortionate policies that are being carried out in this country and elsewhere. And it's very easy when you start to feel like you're under threat to lose sight of that and to start becoming really tribalized. And it's so important to not do that because that's the only way that everyone, that we all win, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just with an eye to giving some time for q and A, I'm going to kind of throw out a double question if you guys could, uh, could both maybe reflect on it. Um, sort of for folks that maybe want to start doing organizing or want to become more effective organizers or even maybe you know, start looking at running for a political office, um, what are some of the best ways, in your opinion, to start doing that? What are the most important pieces of guidance that you would want to share with them? And also, what, you know, Ben, you said that you thought like hopefulness was one of the most important important things for you. I think it's probably true of a lot of us. Um, what are a couple of things that give you hope on a daily basis? I, I mean, the thing that I get hope and energy from is people in the face of everything believing that they can fight and change things and then doing it. I, and I think my advice is kind of to find those people. Uh, finding a group of people that wants to do something is the key to everything. It is, I mean, so if you're an isolated hermit type person by nature, maybe this is bad advice for you, but uh, in general, finding some people that like have an idea about how to change, how to make a difference in something that is, uh, that you find credible and then finding your role within it, finding, and then finding the thing that you're good at that you can bring to the mix. Um, it takes so many different types of people and so many different skills to make change and you, I think there's, Sometimes, at least for myself, what can be overwhelming is feeling like you don't have all the different skills that you need. And the, the tonic for that is discovering that actually you don't have to do everything. You just need to like find a group that together can do everything. And um, I have also just found, I think since growing up, that uh, being in community with people that are fighting for something bigger than any of the people in that community that builds relationships. That's my, I met my wife putting up posters for a rally in the AIDS campaign when I was in college. And my uh, closest friends are still people that I've been involved with these fights each, at each phase of my life with. And you discover you know, a bigness within yourself in the, in the course of those kinds of fights. And you also see the best parts of other people. Because when people are thinking beyond themselves and thinking about how they can, how they can build something better, people's kind of best selves come forward. So it's really kind of about finding community. And, and it's, you know, there's lots of different ways to kind of wage the battle for change, and sometimes it's protests in the street, and sometimes it's meetings in a room, and sometimes it's people chatting with each other online. But if you, once you find that group of people, like, dig in deep, take the time to build relationships with other people within it, like, on top of the work, like, take the time to tell your story and hear other people's stories and really listen to it, and then hold on to those people. And I think that's, like, for everyone I know who's spent their lifetime making this kind of difference, what they're able to kind of draw on is the, the continued inspiration and energy of the other folks in the movement. Mm -hmm. Well said. Shereen? I have very little different advice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that the key to organizing, it's all about relationships. That is, that is the, the prime way of, of advancing successful campaigns and, um, and getting involved in the work. And I similarly think that, that there are so many different identifying what is your gift, you know, what is the asset that you have, what is the thing that you bring 
to everything that you do that make, that gives you energy, that makes you feel like you excel in the world. The social, the social justice movement that you're passionate about needs that. Um, I started Healing to Action because I felt like the gifts that I brought were having these difficult conversations about issues that people didn't want to talk about. Um, but it also, my work requires so many gifts that I don't have, <laughs> and it shows sometimes. And um, so you either have to teach yourself these skills or find people with those gifts. And I have felt very lucky that there have been many people that have extraordinary gifts and web design and data entry and speaking Spanish and you know writing newsletters that have approached our work and said, can I help? And that is really the best way to get started. Find something that you care about and figure out what you excel at and then combine the two. Um, in terms of what gives me hope, similarly, it is the people that I meet that just blow me away all the time. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about about a year and a half ago, I met um, a woman at a conference uh, that I was, a labor conference that I was giving a panel about our work on. And um, she approached me and she, she was a wheelchair user and um, a, dis, a very um, passionate disability self-advocate in Chicago. And she approached me after the panel and she said, you know, we really need to send her the voices of people with disabilities in this discussion, and I want to work with you to do that. And um, we've spent the last year building this relationship, and she has brought all of these incredible organizers into the work of Healing to Action. We've been holding events. She's been recruiting people into our leadership program. Um, last night, we had our big annual fundraiser, and uh, several of those people came to the fundraiser to support our work. And so just thinking about those kinds of trajectories or the leaders in our work who are working the night shift, and then they leave work and come at 8 a.m. to a press action to give remarks. You know, These are the kinds of people that you get to experience all the time when you're fighting for social change. And so um, I am constantly drawing energy from those people, and I completely agree that A, find those people and B, um, make sure that you take the moment to really appreciate those people, like be present in the moment with them. Take the moment to just really think about what they're doing, how incredible it is, and then I feel like that it's, it's hard not to feel totally grateful for what you're doing no matter how hard the work is. That's such a great note to end on, much as I kind of want to just keep talking to you both forever. <laughs> um, I will open things up to, uh, to you guys now because I'm sure there's a lot of folks that would like to engage with Ben and Shreen as well. So we have 15 minutes or maybe a little bit more, and I think there's folks with mics somewhere. Yes? <laughs> 10, okay. Was there somebody? Yes. Um, yeah. uh, ben, um, you've got one amazing challenge in front of you in Wisconsin. Um, I mean, 2018, that blue wave in the state. I mean, it re-elects Tammy Baldwin. It gives the Democrats 200,000 more votes in the assembly. It, it flips all of the statewide offices, and it budges one seat in the assembly. How is it possible to imagine a bigger wave in 2020 that actually does flip those 14 seats or so that you have to find in the assembly. The, the Supreme Court is unfriendly and the, the loss back in the spring of that key seat. It's a really tough road. I guess I'm just wondering kind of what you see as like realistic, victorious steps to try to restore democracy in Wisconsin. <sighs> Um, <laughs> so, I won't sugarcoat it. Republicans did a, a devilish and brilliant job gerrymandering the legislative maps in Wisconsin, and while there are various catastrophic scenarios that could lead to the kind of wave that could actually get over the castle walls and like re result in a democratic majority, most of them involve like a worldwide economic meltdown that I really don't hope for. Um, I think the, the bigger fight that we're focused on right now is stopping the supermajority. So essentially, um, in Wisconsin, we've got this spring election, in the spring, the same day as the presidential primary is our Supreme Court race. And uh, if, Republic, if, if Democrats can stop the super right-wing current justice who's running for re-election, 
Um, that creates the possibility of having a non-right-wing operative controlled Supreme Court in the state in 2023. So the first step is organized like crazy for the spring election. The second step is in the fall. The second step is actually the National Convention, which is in the summer. And the goal for that is to find thousands of volunteers at the National Convention to train people, get them committed to being involved in the fall so that we can make the absolute best possible use of the summer. Uh, talk to everyone who comes to their county fairs and state fair across the state. Just be everywhere. Um, go into the fall. Um, in the state Senate and the state assembly, if Republicans get three more seats, they get their super majorities, and they can override the governor's veto of gerrymandered maps and lock in their control. If Democrats can stop that from happening, then what will happen in 2021 is that the Republican state legislature will propose terrible maps, no doubt, and then the governor will veto those maps, and then it'll go to the courts. Now, Republicans have some strategies to try to get a good ruling out of our, they'll try to get it to happen in the state courts as opposed to federal court. We have legal strategies to try to make it happen in federal court, because even though Trump has tried to pack all the federal courts, he has been less successful than Wisconsin Republicans have been in packing state courts. So if, it's, if the maps are adjudicated in federal court, very likely they'll be much more small d democratic than the current maps. And then we get to 2022. So the challenge is if we, if we do what we have got to do and stop Trump in 2020, 2022 could be a Republican backlash year. Mm. So we remember 2010, we won everything in 2008 and 2010 Republicans mm -hmm. roared back to the Tea Party, it was their version of 2018. And so with all the stuff we're doing in the state party in Wisconsin right now, we're thinking about how do we make sure we're actually building capacity and building power so that we come out of 2020 and are able to organize for 2022 and stop a red wave from, you know, from destroying everything. Um, but that year we'll have potentially new, uh, new maps after the redistricting process. So you know, federal court draws the new maps, then we have try to survive a Republican wave. If we can reelect our Democratic governor, if we can hold on to as many seats as possible, maybe gain some, then 2024, President, Democratic President Blank is up for re-election. I'm neutral in the primary by constitution of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, but there's a, another presidential year, and uh, there we'll have our best shot at getting Democrat, and also we'll have a Supreme, state Supreme Court, potentially, if we win in 2023. So 2024 could be the key year to get a Democratic majority in the state legislature, and then the next year we could undo the voter ID laws and the, you know, all the terrible things Republicans have put in place. And by 2026, a bare seven years from now, we could have democracy in Wisconsin. Um, now, maybe, there's a, maybe there are, fa <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, maybe there are faster ways to do it, but I, I, I have to say like, uh, I, think as Demo I think Democrats and progressives often are Re like it fe all feels so big that we want to be able to make the, the biggest change as fast as possible. And I actually think it's um, often you like want that and then it feels impossible and then you fall into total despair. And there's something actually helpful about having a kind of realistic and-, and Master plan. Yeah, master plan. <laughs> having a master plan. Republicans have tried it and it worked for them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, I think it is good to have a long-term theory about how we, how we do this work. And um, it gives people it allows people to celebrate incremental victories along the way, even if they're still facing impossible odds afterwards, because you know, with each step, uh, you can realize that you're making progress towards an ultimate goal that can make a difference in people's lives. And sometimes, even if you have to deviate a little bit from that plan, just knowing that there's a plan there, that then you have something to start with, I think is psychologically and practically very constructive, right? Yes, so. yeah. Another question. All right, so my question happens to be similar to the first question, but it's for you, Mr. Wickler. Um, so I like your plan. I think it is very well thought out, but a lot of that also requires on winning Wisconsin for 2020 and organizing enough Democrats. I like to think that I'm an optimist and that um, Wisconsin can flip back, back to blue, but in 2016, Trump v. Clinton, Trump won by 10,000 votes. In 2018, Walker v. Evers, Evers won by 30,000 votes. And then this Supreme Court race this spring, the anti-gay conservative Supreme Court Justice Brian Hagedorn won by 5,000 votes. So as optimistic as I want to be, what is your plan to ensure that statewide Democrats are... 
How are you planning to get these narrow margins almost more democratic, and how do we plan to keep the statewide races blue rather than only just like the legislative districts, which, like I said, I think you have a great plan for, but how do we plan to keep the statewide races blue? Yeah. Um, so this will be, it'll be really tough is the first thing I want to say. So Wisconsin um, was blue in every presidential race um, from 1988 till 2012 and then went Republican in 2016. And for, that sort of seemed like a shock that Rep Wisconsin went for a Republican presidential candidate. People forget that Wisconsin was the closest state in the country in 2004. And it was even closer in 2000 than it was in 2004 in the presidential race. It's just nobody noticed because Florida happened. So uh, then Obama won big, and then Walker won big, and then Obama won big, and then Walker won big. And like it was zigzagging. It's essentially an, a, an evenly divided, polarized state that is in, uh, you know, it's democracy in chains in Wisconsin because of Walker's rules. So there is no, uh, you know, I wouldn't be suddenly optimistic about our chance to waltz into victory. It is going to be a fight for every vote. Um, I think that we have some structural opportunities that if we use them right, allow us to have a really good shot at doing it if we work really hard. So the first is that spring election, it's on the same day as the presidential primary, April 7th of 2020. And what that means is that there will be a, a spring election where there are a ton of, there are potentially multiple Democrats still running for president and a, a ton of like get out the vote activity that they're doing. And for the state party, our strategy is to use the spring as a dress rehearsal for the fall election, get thousands of volunteers working across the state, knock on ridiculous numbers of doors, field test all the tactics we wanna use in the fall. So that it's like normally what happens in an election year is it's this kind of one big ramp up to the election day and then you discover at the end what worked and what didn't. And we wanna use the spring election and the presidential primary as a kind of test run for everything and get tons of people involved. Um, so hopefully our, our graph looks like that. Then we have the national convention and we wanna make that a giant organizing opportunity. Actually, I should use my acronym if you don't, okay, I'm gonna, Try this out on you. My acronym is WISCO for our five fight plan for 2020. So it's win the spring election, inspire thousands of volunteers at this national convention, stop the supermajority for the state legislature, cancel Trump, is the C, <laughs> um, and then organize for the future. So um, the, the spring and the national convention, what those do is allow us to find tons and tons of volunteers to get involved in our field operation. And the way we're doing field in Wisconsin is I think the best model for field organizing, which is rather than having staff knock on doors or paying people to call volunteers to knock on doors, our organizers are actually, their job is to help communities build their own capacity to organize their own grassroots field organizing. So we have neighborhood teams across the state, several hundred of them, and our staff basically work with them to learn how to run teams and how to, how to build power in their own communities. And those folks run the canvassing. And that means that uh, you know, we actually have 13 field organizers now more than a year out from the election. And at each of these moments, we'll be able to bring in more folks, start more teams, help our teams get stronger, so that by the end of the election, when everyone is suddenly like, I wanna help, the, everyone will be able to find a team that's close to them and they'll be working in their own communities. The most powerful messengers are always the people in their own communities, talking to people who understand their local issues. And these folks will have knocked through the spring election, uh, they'll have been involved in the convention in the summer, into the fall, they'll already know their neighbors. Many of them, uh, we've been organizing with this model in Wisconsin continuously since the spring of 2017. And there's uh, research that finds that the longer you organize in an area, the more effective you are because you're not a stranger when you, when you go to someone's door. And so that's why we're building this push now. Um, we'll, we'll grow in the spring, we'll grow in the, in the summer, and then by the time we get to election day, the goal is because we planted the tree now, it's gonna be huge by then. Um, on the other side, the Republican Party is actually like publicly saying, I talked to a reporter today who just heard this from the Republican Party of Wisconsin, they're copying our model. They're building a neighborhood uh, team structure around the state. And I have no illusions that like they're gonna, they're putting essentially unlimited resources into winning Wisconsin on the Republican side. So this won't be easy, but I do think this is the strategy that has the highest leverage in terms of the impact per hour and per dollar. And you combine that with work we're doing digitally, with, uh, with data, you know, a bunch of the different building blocks. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I don't think we're gonna win in a blowout unless, you know, the world shifts on its axis a little bit, which is always possible. 
but I think we have a shot at, at beating Republicans in a, in a state that's often decided by 1% or less. Another question? I, I was hoping we could spend a minute or so just talking about activism more generically or organizing more generically. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone who is inclined to do something has somewhere in their, in their constitution a passion around the issue they're backing. And that can lead to uh, activities outside the law, activities counter to peace and civility, activities that can be violent. So as you think about, you know, just the founding of our nation was an activist act that was in violation of the law. What counsel or advice would you give younger folks who are about to get involved in a way they haven't before as things approach that point, that point of activism, that point of organizing where, you know, you might go to jail, you might break a law, you might hurt someone or something. Uh, do you have any, any opinion on, on that? I'd love to hear your thinking around that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really great question. Um, there's uh, particularly in Chicago, there's been some <laughs> heavily documented incidents of this in recent years, um, and particularly when you're thinking about uh, people who are already very vulnerable to police brutality and police violence, um, as well as people that have a lot to lose by losing their jobs, losing their livelihood by getting arrested. All of these are questions. Um, that I think any responsible organizing, you have to really counsel people through the risks of taking those kinds of actions. That said, there, civil disobedience is a very powerful tool. We've seen it work here. We've seen it work in Washington. We've seen it work across the country. Um, I don't know, Ben, if you've ever engaged in civil disobedience. I, I have not been arrested in a protest. M neither have I, so perhaps we're not talking to the right people. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Um, but I do think you know that that's something that comes up quite a bit because there's not, in a lot of ways there's nothing more powerful than than rejecting the law in hand you know saying I'm not going to stand for this and I'm willing to put my body on the line my freedom on the line to protest this um, so it is a very powerful tool but I think it's one that needs to be very carefully used and people need to be counseled through what all of the risks are um, I'm trying to think if I have any other things to add I don't know if there's something that you wanted to to, to add as well. I think that the key aspect of this is to understand it as a, as a tactic. Mm -hmm. um, I would also make a, draw a huge distinction between nonviolent civil disobedience mm -hmm. and uh, actions that can hurt other people. And the, you know, the act of putting yourself where you're not legally allowed to be in a public way in front of television cameras where you're, people can see you getting arrested in, in service of a goal, and sometimes even being under physical threat, you can see how that you know, what that did in the civil rights movement and the Indian independence movement, anti-apartheid movement, all these different movements, that's very, that's very different from tactics where um, you're putting somebody else at physical risk. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the, the best activism in general starts with strategy and it's, school, it's, it's rooted in an understanding of the power dynamics involved and, and what's going on. I think when civil disobedience has, a, has an impact, it comes from a deep analysis. It comes from an analysis of the different actors involved. And it's usually part of a broader strategy where there's other actors doing different parts of the work. And I think, you know, when I, I was very involved in the fight against the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. And my job at MoveOn.org was working with the elected Democrats and uh, with, you know, national progressive organizations, with MoveOn members across the country. And I worked very closely with disability rights activists who, um, famously, and there was this electrifying moment where a group of activists with ADAPT went to Mitch McConnell's office mm -hmm. and parked their wheelchairs in his office and were dragged out by um, police and security guards and they were chanting, um, no cuts to Medicaid. And they made just so incredibly clear with, through their own sacrifice and putting their own bodies on the line that this was a life or death issue for them. And that worked uh, because it was this, the fruit of this incredible strategic work that they'd done. They knew that Mitch McConnell's office was right by the media center where all the TV cameras were. And they you know, organized and planned for weeks and months exactly how to get into the building without arousing suspicion and being able to be there at that exact time. It changed the whole national debate. I mean, I have protection for pre-existing conditions and I have asthma because they did that. They put their bodies on the line at that moment. 
Uh, but that was the fruit of you know, 40 years of, of, of ADAPT activism for disability rights that started with uh, fighting for disability access to buses in, in cities around the country. And it's, I think sometimes when people are starting in this work, they can see a sort of romance to that kind of tactic. And I think it's the, the critical thing is to learn, learn the context and learn the strategy. Um, I, I was very lucky in college to learn from a group of activists who'd helped uh, create ACT UP, which is a group that, you know, again, saved millions of lives and transformed how AIDS drugs are developed and how the government responds to AIDS. And they use civil disobedience tactics all the time, um, but they, you know, they, it, they had to do it as part of a strategy that understood the power that they were encountering. Um, and I think knowing, you know, for anyone who is doing it, doing it from the perspective of how do you uh, change, the, how do you affect the outcome that you're trying to create as opposed to like, how does this tactic feel or seem in isolation? And all, oh, sorry, go ahead. oh, sorry, I was just going to also add that I think, again, returning to that conversation we had earlier about um, the people at the margins, thinking about how if you do have certain privileges, um, whether it is, you know, that you're less likely to experience police brutality, whether it is that you have more understanding of your legal rights, to put your body on the line is one of the greatest acts of, of um, solidarity that you can practice. Um, so I would... I would also, you know, I think that it's, it's interesting because a lot of times the most powerful actions are coming from the people who are most impacted by the issues, as um, Ben mentioned that example um, with Mitch McConnell's office. But I think that, that that's also something I can say that speaking with a lot of communities that are working on these issues is a source of frustration and sometimes despair that um, it always ends up being the people who are literally fighting for their lives who are putting their bodies on the line. Yeah, ab absolutely. And in fact, interestingly enough, there's actually evidence that, you know, kind of making this distinction between violence, where your question started, and nonviolent civil disobedience, um, actually, it's the nonviolent civil disobedience that tends to be effective in crystallizing public support for a movement and maybe moving thinking um, and creating visibility, whereas uh, creating violence tends to overall, if we look at movements across the world over the course of the last several decades, tends to actually have the opposite effect. So both strategically and ethically speaking, right, there's some real important differences. I think that we have time for one or maybe two more, depending on just kind of how those play out. So who would like to be next? I, I, um, I work with Indivisible Chicago, and we do a lot of organizing. We'll see you in Wisconsin, Ben. We're already there, in fact. Um, and it seems to me that the key to winning in 2020 is somewhere between the two worlds you're describing. That is, where Shireen is working with impacted communities on issues that are most important to them, we organize from within communities on electing uh, new leadership, which does not seem as important or as relevant to communities that are focused on uh, violence issues and education and access and all these other critical, very personal things. How do you make that bridge? I hear Ben's strategy about working within neighborhoods and communities, but I think it has to go deeper, right, for the kind of constituents that don't typically vote that might be involved in the domestic violence and other issues in your world. I'm happy to answer, and I'd love to hear Shireen's thoughts on this as well. Um, the, there's a bunch of research about non-voters, and I think if you're somebody who always votes, it's easy to imagine people don't vote because they don't care. Uh, and the research says it's the exact opposite. It's that people tend, there are, there are barriers to people voting, and uh, people often have given up on the system as, as not being responsive to them or uh, being rigged in a way that their own participation won't matter. And um, there's a sense in which building power on anything and helping people find that they can affect anything helps create the bridge to being able to, to decide to participate in a system that fundamentally is based on a kind of very earnest civic trust, which is the idea that going in and casting a ballot could determine the most powerful person in the world. Um, so in that sense, I think the bridge actually goes from Shireen's work with people who might, you know, might experience the deck being totally stacked against them and helping them find their voice and find their power. That's the bridge into being, to participating in all these other ways. And mm -hmm. although voting might seem like a simple act, it's actually, in a sense, uh, the, the top of a ladder of a whole bunch of steps of thinking that you have agency and power in the world 
um, and, and also the kind of flexibility and control of your life to be able to go and cast the ballot. And the, the foundational work of, of finding ways that people can experience their own power uh, is the thing that can lead to that most powerfully. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think that um, the, what, what I, how I see your question is when I look at our, the leaders that we are organizing who can, many of them cannot vote. Um, and so, and it's really hard to, and as I've mentioned, there's other ways that you might measure success in organizing that it would be really hard to hit those targets with these communities because there's so much fear in the community because the topics are so difficult to talk about. But the way that I think that this connects to me is when I look at their children, when I look at the next generation, and when we can define impact as people who are seeing and owning their power, they're telling stories they've never told before, um, that can have an impact that ripples through generations and really results in a, a sort of um, a family dynamic of civic engagement. Um, and we've seen that already with the work that we're doing, people's sons and daughters and family members coming. And these are going to be voters. You know, These are people that are in high school. They're people that are in college um, who are seeing their parents tell stories about issues that impact them, are seeing them take risks in their community, are seeing them uh, speak to the media, or just speak to their neighbors, speak to their brother or sister or their spouse about something they've never talked about before. And they're seeing the, this as acts of leadership and inspiration. And so I do think that. Um, if you can build, we talk a lot about organizing as building a muscle. So if you can build the muscle of the community so that everyone feels like they can make an impact, that they do have certain power to affect change, that can really change the culture of that community and, and mobilize people over time. I really can't think of any more hopeful place that we could end. So I think we're going to wrap up there. Thank you so much to Shireen and Ben. Um, very thankful to um, Ali for putting all this together and everyone who's made it uh, to make who's made it great, um, which there's just countless of, and to all of you for being here. If you are a Roosevelt alum, or you know maybe even if you're just uh, part of the Roosevelt community, there is a reception at 6.30 in the Ida B. Wells Lounge on the second floor that's aimed at young Roosevelt alums. And then our next formal event is going to be tomorrow at 2 for the 26th annual Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Lecture by the Center for New Deal Studies, where we're going to be featuring Kelly Clements, who's the UN Deputy High Commissioner on Refugees, talking about refugees and community and asylum and what that means uh, in today's United States. So um, thank you all again for being here, and thanks again to our panel. Thank you.